You know, it, it's interesting to me now the push of of the Project Management Institute and CompTIA to start opening up a little bit to different ways of doing things. The Project Management Body of Knowledge 6th edition in every single chapter has considerations for agile or adaptive environments. And the Agile Practice Guide is a companion guide to the Project Management Body of Knowledge 6th edition, which is basically saying, if this is going on in your organization, here's some best practices from agile frameworks like Scrum that you can implement in your current project. So having the ability to tailor your projects is, is a really big thing. And PMI actually partnered with the Agile Alliance, which is, you know, the two have been sort of uh, on opposing sports teams for a while, but now they uh, work together and they decided, all right, well, let's take into consideration some things that may be relevant in the predictive world and use some of the predictive environment in a more agile space. So if you think about agile, agility, the ability to pivot and move quickly, and then scrum, which is a rugby term, where there's a group of people working together toward a common goal, then you're already halfway there, all right? So agile project management, the practice of agility, and the ability to really kind of work together as a team in a different way. Like I said, scrum is, is one of the most popular. Um, when people say agile, they, they think, Scrum in some cases, but like I said, that's not that's not everything. There are other types of frameworks. Scrum just happens to be the most popular. If you decided you wanted to be a certified Scrum master, you would unfortunately have to go through the Scrum Alliance and go to a two-day thing and then take an exam. So you'd actually have to go to a location which I did, and it was eye-opening, and it was great, and all of that, and I was pursuing my uh, Agile Certified Practitioner certification through the Project Management Institute, because see, they're, yeah, they're jumping on the Agile train, and, and then I wrote a book about the ACP, and all the research, all the training, all the everything, and then also doing a lot of these things, I found that there some things are better <laughs> in, in Agile than in predictive project management, but I, there's an overlap for me I don't practice true Scrum, but organizations that do really follow the framework to a T. And that's why people like Scrum, because there's an actual framework. It's not so like willy-nilly. There are uh, real rules uh, to how the life cycle works, and it's understandable, so stakeholders get on board with it, but a lot of times organizations are like, why aren't you still doing big earned value reports and Gantt charts? And you're like, because we don't do that in Agile. But we can, if you want us to, we can, we can tailor. But where did Agile begin? Actually, it began much earlier than 2001. Let's put it that way. It, it began in the early 70s and 80s and so on because organizations were just starting to get to that point where they needed automated systems. And that led to the technological age after we exited the industrial age. And the technological age brought a lot of challenges with it because predictive project management was utilized for construction, building bridges, mass producing. And now these days we have software development and hardware installs and shorter projects rather than these long-term billion dollar projects. It's at the point where the Agile Alliance got together in 2001, 17 software developers met in Snowbird, Utah, and really had a, a conference to try and figure out what some of the best practices maybe could be and align different frameworks so that they could be utilized effectively. A lot of the folks that attended the Agile Alliance Conference in, in Snowboard, Utah, to create what's called the Agile Manifesto, had already created some frameworks on their own simply by working in the industries that they were, updating payroll systems at Toyota and trying to implement different best practices for software design. And so that's where we get a bunch of different frameworks like extreme programming and Scrum and implementing Lean and Kanban and all of those things. But the Agile Alliance, 17 software developers, all got together and decided, all right, let's put together a manifesto, a statement of what we feel is most important for people to know about Agile. 
The first one is that it's based on iterative and incremental development. There's no predictive about it. All we know is somebody wants a website built for their business. We don't know what all that's going to look like, how many pages, what kind of code we're going to use, is it pictures, graphics, and so on. doesn't need to fit on cell phones, iPads, computers, and so on. So it's iterative. We kind of know what we're doing, but it's also incremental. People change their minds, and that's okay. But the goal is to really produce higher quality software and shorter time frames. Let's get it out quickly. And let's evolve as we go. We'll start, we'll talk about backlogs here in a little bit and how backlogs are never completed, even if you're utilizing the software right now. Requirements and solutions evolve. And that's through collaboration, self-organizing, cross-functional teams. And ultimately, when you look at self-organizing, cross-functional teams, people are like, well, what do you mean? Where's the project manager? We'll talk about that in just a moment. The Agile Manifesto in and of itself represents four key or crucial ideas. The first one is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Very first caveat about the Agile Manifesto is that they weren't saying processes and tools aren't important. They're saying it's more important to work with individuals and interact with people than it is to say, we've always done it this way, this is what we're using. Sorry, I'm not taking any feedback from you. Instead, we want to focus on interacting with people, communicating and collaborating and all of that over a process and tool. If a tool isn't working or it's not relevant, then we're not going to use it. Two, working software over comprehensive documentation. Comprehensive documentation without software is a waste of time. It just is. So if we spend a lot of time creating a front-loaded plan, that's heavily documented, just like everything that we've just talked about, and we can't actually predict what the end result will be, that it will change, and it will change frequently. So it's a waste of time to create something and then have to redo, redo, redo. This is, in fact, one of the big things that <laughs> a lot of key stakeholders don't understand when Scrum or others get implemented in their organization. They're like, where are the reports? Where are the baselines? Where are the management plans? So even though a lot of times, like on an Agile exam, they'll say, uh, our stakeholder says that, oh, they thought people that practice Agile don't plan. It's really a misnomer. We do plan. We just don't do a lot of documentation up front. At the last responsible moment is what we call it. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Now, what's interesting is we just came out of procurement, right? And that was push out your statement of work. People respond to it. There's a negotiation. Now there's a contract. Can't breach it. All of that. It's very formal. But if you don't really know what the scope of work is going to be, then there has to be some flexibility in procurement. So procurement for agile projects is very different from what we just looked at in a predictive environment. It's closer to a cost reimbursable situation just in the respect that we need to be able to change scope of work at a moment's notice as needed and we don't want to breach contract responding to change over following a plan it, the, agile is the polar opposite of predictive project management <laughs> responding to change no formal change there's no formal change control we don't have to go through a change control board nothing like that and yeah having a plan is great but we want to be able to change that plan as needed and that's more important than having a front-loaded plan that we are expected to follow and that means baselines and the like. That is the basis of the Agile Manifesto. And they're not saying, hey, do this over this. They're saying this is, we value individuals and interactions more than processes and tools and responding to change over following a plan. It's a very different way of uh, looking at project management because this is mostly about software development. It's, you know, more geared toward that, but Agile is not just for software anymore at all and that's why it's becoming more popular as a type of framework for project management our focus will be on scrum it's the most popular framework it's got some very definitive rules and, and things that are part of it that make it a bit easier to follow but we'll talk about scrum theory where it came from what the values of scrum are who's on the scrum team what that looks like we'll talk about the artifacts of scrum the different events and the transparency of those artifacts which is communication and charts and graphs and 
transparent communication. And we're going to look at Scrum as pure Scrum. There are there's Scrum Bon out there. There's all sorts of tailored approaches, large scale Scrum, and some of these other things that sort of popped out of the original Scrum because it wasn't necessarily conforming with what they needed. But we're going pure Scrum here. Very first thing is that the teams are self-directed and self-managed. There is nobody that is saying in absolute terms, do this, do this, I've assigned you to that. Instead, the team will be given the work that is of most value to the customer right now in this moment. They will select the work that they can accomplish based on the most valuable features and they decide how to do it. We don't say, you do this, it should take this long. You're like, all right, you've got 30 days, this is what you've selected, go forth and do it. They're self-directed. They're cross-functional, which means they have uh, very specific skill sets, but they can do other things. Therefore, the team then decides. It's like, here's the work you guys organize around it. They will deliver something functional and usable at the end of every, in this case, sprint or iteration. Most iterations are about 30 days or less. So at the end of 30 days, there will be something that can be tested, that can be accepted, and that is minimally marketable, meaning if the organization wanted to push it out, they could. The team is not dependent upon others. There is no project manager. We'll go through uh, the three main key roles on a Scrum team, but if you've already got a group that's like, you just tell them, here's what we got to do, and they just go do it, that's a self-directed team. And that's not easy in the beginning because some people are used to being directed. But in a, in a true Scrum environment, there is no project manager. As far as the history is concerned, Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland first presented Scrum at a conference in 1995. Now remember, the manifesto wasn't created until 2001. So a lot of these folks were putting together these frameworks that were working within their core systems. And this happened to do with programming and language and applica developing applications. Think about 1995. Just think about 1995, okay? As far as internet capability, we literally would load a page and you'd, you'd hear the modem sound, you know, and then it would take four hours to load the page. That's what was going on in 1995. So even then, they're looking at that and saying, we're trying to develop software to help automate systems and organizations, and it's not working. It's not, this is not helpful. The thing about Scrum is it's a framework, it's not a set process. And that's because your team is self-directed, self-managed. There are certain framework or rules that are expected, but Scrum just in general is a lightweight framework. It's very simple to understand. It's not difficult at all. There's nothing crazy in here, but it's, it's difficult to master. And it's easy to talk about, it's hard to do. And the reason why it's hard to do is because ultimately it's a different, it's a shift from what most people are used to as far as industrial age siloed approach to predictive project management. Scrum originated based on something called empirical process control, which is what do we know? What knowledge have we gained? Let's utilize our experience to make decisions. There is no, this is how we've always done it. It's did that work? Nope. All right, let's try something else. Uh, making mistakes is, ex is expected and accepted because we learn lessons. And at the end of every sprint or iteration, we practice continuous improvement. So we look at the past 30 days and go, all right, what are we going to fix? What are we going to keep doing? What will we stop doing? And what will we change? All right, implement it in the next 30 days. So it's immediate. Iterative and incremental allows for optimization. And if you're only planning 30 days of work, like, and I know if you guys have really short projects, like two weeks, Agile might work better for you. Uh, because you, if you're spending a week trying to document what the other week is supposed to look like, you might be wasting your own time a little bit. But looking for predictability and optimizing predictability in the framework is what protects the project from risk. That doesn't mean there isn't risk. It just means that we're only really planning 30 days there small projects over the course of time, which is interesting to me. The three pillars of Scrum theory are transparency, inspection, 
and the the ability to adapt and pivot. That's that's part of uh, agility, just in general. These are the the core or three pillars that drive empiricism or empirical process control. The first being transparent communication, and really that is everybody understands what common standards there are, what the common language is, meaning everybody says, oh, we have a daily scrum or we're working with the product backlog. Everybody knows what things are called, the charts, the graphs, and they are transparent in their communication. Another part of transparency is a common understanding of the definition of done. That's actually, the definition of done is a very agile buzzword, sentence, whatever, definite, what does done look like? Now, done at the end of 30 days could be very different from done done at the end of the project. So we're going to talk more about the product backlog and understanding what the definition of done is, but it's still in a way trying to predict what we think the end result will be. That could change. That could totally change. I want that button over here instead of over here. I want the website to run videos instead of static pictures. All of those things could change, but what does done look like? between now and 30 days from now? What is something that we can create to push out? Inspection, there's frequent inspection. In fact, there's a, usually what's called a test first design, meaning you write the test before you write the code. That way you know that it's going to fail the test, but when it passes, it's ready to go. How are we moving toward our goal? What are the variances or differences? But here's the thing, we don't inspect enough that it disrupts the work. It's just sort of built into the process. Sometimes there are skilled inspectors to improve the results, but typically only when an organization is implementing Scrum across the board. It's, it's good to have inspectors and Scrum masters and all of that trying to inspect and make sure that there's continuous improvement of the processes and frameworks. And adapt, absolutely adapt. If, if we inspect the result and it's not working, and it's bad or it's buggy or the code is terrible, we need to be able to adapt and, and fix that. And there are four formal events that we go through, and we'll talk about this life cycle as well, but we go through sprint planning. Then there's a daily scrum, which is a daily stand-up meeting. I talked about that yesterday. Then there's a sprint review. That's with the customer and the team and stakeholders and the customer tests the increment or whatever they've created. Uh, gives feedback and accepts it or asks for changes. Then the team goes immediately into something called a sprint retrospective. This is every 30 days at max. The team will get together and do a lessons learned meeting. The retrospective itself is about three hours long. What will we continue doing? What will we stop doing? And where can we make some improvements going forward? which is a huge deal with continuous improvement because the team is going to be a little bit off in the beginning in their estimates and what they think they can do versus what gets done. And so being able to look back and adapt at least every 30 days. Some, some sprints are two weeks long. So every two weeks, the team is getting together and saying, hey, what are we going to change? The values of Scrum and successful use of Scrum depends on proficiency in commitment Courage, focus, openness, and respect. Okay, so here's the big difference in it. When I first started learning Scrum, I was like, wow, this is really cool, but it's a tad kumbaya also. But I like it, I dig it, because there's commitment, there's courage to make mistakes, there's a no finger pointing environment, there's a lot of focus, there's a lot of transparent communication, and respect is given. And respect is, is earned, but it's also given as well.